on the 15th of October 1953, in the barren wilderness of the Australian outback, preparations for the first British atomic test explosion on the Australian mainland were reaching their climax. One of the final tasks on that fateful day fell to the man who had surveyed the site and worked on its construction for the past two years, Len Bedell. I was the surveyor for the project, but I had to go to the foot of the tower and join up two wires. So I went along to the foot of the tower along this road right here on the morning that it was due to go off, half an hour before it exploded. And I looked up the tower and there was this ominous black atom bomb. I joined up the two wires after leaving my Land Rover a half an inch away from me, idling over at seven million revs. And I got into the Land Rover and went back to the control tower and handed in my personnel key. So William Penny and I stood there. The rest of the people, the, all the construction workers and everyone were uh, strictly controlled back at the Claypan village area. And uh, the countdown came to minus 10, 9, 8. And of course, we had our backs to the bomb and when it went off, the whole of this country that we could see from that rocky outcrop, we could see a, a bright, brilliant sky. Everything lit up in the most blinding orange flash that you could possibly imagine on such a scale. Today, it's hard to imagine the awesome destruction that was unleashed on that October morning over 30 years ago. These stone pyramids stand as monuments to man's brief and violent intrusion into the quiet isolation of the desert. Yet for many years, these monuments were not the only evidence of that intrusion. Six piston-engined Mustang fighter aircraft were placed directly in the target area. One in particular was destined to become the center of one of the most amazing recovery operations ever undertaken. The Mustang aeroplane was one of the most successful and famous piston-engine fighters ever built. Originally designed and built by North American Aviation, the Mustang was destined to achieve glory and fame in many theatres of war throughout the world. The obvious potential of the Mustang led to the Australian government seeking the rights to build the aeroplane under licence for use by the Royal Australian Air Force. Built by the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation in 1945, the first, A68-1, was put through its paces by test pilot Jim Schofield. Well, the very first test flight of the Mustang was uh uh, very uh, rewarding sort of a feeling. The Mustang was an extraordinarily good aircraft. Uh, it was particularly suitable for long-range escort flying. There were fighters that were slightly faster, but none of them had the overall performance of the Mustang. We had some difficulties, uh, as it happened, with the uh, high-speed supercharger on A68-1. I think we finished up doing eight altitude tests before we got it right. That was an unusual fault, but it wasn't in any way hazardous. Jim Schofield left the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation not long after he finished testing A68-1. Little did he realise that his association with this historic and ill-fated aeroplane was by no means over. On the 25th of June, 1953, Arthur Fadden, the acting Prime Minister of Australia, announced plans to establish an atomic test site on the Australian mainland. Len Bedell, surveyor, engineer and expert on the harsh Australian outback, was asked to locate a suitable site for the tests. To find a site suitable, we had to need an area well out of the way and uh, room to move to place uh, thousands of instruments around to be able to record the results of the bomb. So I came up here in the middle of 1952 to, to search the whole of this country and by accident I came upon a clay pan which was nearly a mile long, half a mile wide, 
perfect natural runway in the middle of this wilderness. And so I thought, well, I'll um, use that as a base camp and radiate out from that in all directions. And from there on, this became the first atom bomb site in Australia. The site which Len had chosen was named Emu Plains. Situated in the great Victorian desert, Emu is 600 miles from the nearest major city, Adelaide, and over 150 miles from the nearest civilization, isolated by a vast expanse of the most arid and hostile wasteland in the world. During 1953, hundreds of scientists, technicians and military personnel lived and worked in this desolate area as the vast and complex preparations were made to study the effects of the most terrifying weapon in history. As well as the enormous array of scientific test instruments, several other items were ranged around the bomb to see what effect the blast would have on them. A 52-ton Centurion tank, even the superstructure of a battleship, and finally, six Mustang fighters. Among them, the first built in Australia, a681. John Ashton served with the Royal Australian Air Force as a pilot and flying instructor during the Second World War and was still serving in the Air Force in 1953. When I was uh, doing a staff appointment at RAAF headquarters in Melbourne when uh, the opportunity arose to ferry one of four aircraft to uh, Emu Plains, the site of the first atomic uh, explosion. And naturally I jumped to the opportunity to get away from the desk for a few days. The aircraft assigned to John Ashton was the fated A681. So I think that A681 along with a number of other uh, uh, military aircraft were being held in storage and uh, when the Air Force was called upon to supply six for this particular job, someone down the line was detailed to pick them out and uh, a-68-1 just happened to roll out as one of those uh, half dozen. I recall thinking what a great shame it was that uh, an aircraft in such first-class flying condition had to be used for that particular purpose. The six Mustang aeroplanes were flown out, landed on the clay pan, and we brought them out to uh, array them around the bomb to see what the bomb would do to them with an attempt to protect them. So uh, those aeroplanes were arrayed just here where we're standing and uh, I put in pegs for each one where they were to go, propeller uh, towards the bomb, tail towards the bomb, side on, uh, mounds of dirt to see if we could protect them. A681 was positioned here. Two Mustangs were positioned in front of the dirt mound, three behind with A681 in the centre and the sixth was positioned further up the road. At 7 a.m. on the 15th of October, 1953, the bomb was detonated. Incredibly, the six Mustangs survived. I was completely amazed to see the Mustangs still in existence. When I saw the size of the flash and the shockwave which hit us and the noise and the turbulence and everything else that took place at that millionth of a second, I thought nothing within miles of that bomb is going to be uh, recognisable or even in existence. A681 and the other five Mustangs had survived the greatest destructive force that man could create. Their death sentence was now commuted to life imprisonment. So they were left standing in the desert for the next 14 years, waiting patiently for the man who was to give them back their freedom. Tony Schwert has spent most of his life flying and working with aeroplanes. In 1958, Tony joined the Air Force as an airframe mechanic and at the same time took the chance to gain his pilot's license. Today, Tony Schwert is one of Australia's most highly regarded general aviation pilots. Flying has been my living since, uh, I, I guess, since 1963. Um, and uh, I fly most types of aircraft, um, Citation jet, uh, most turbine um, propeller driven types, and uh, all the uh, piston engine aeroplanes, basically, that uh, are available in general aviation. 
Tony's close involvement with the aviation industry keeps him well informed about aircraft movements and histories. One such story was of special interest. I heard the planes were there by word of mouth, uh, so to speak, back in the, in the very early 60s. In fact, uh, whilst I was in the Air Force, um, the fact that they were there for atomic bomb uh, exposure uh, and um, had just kept an eye on them generally um, up until the point in time when the tender came out. The invitation to tender for the disposal of the abandoned Mustangs was issued by the Department of Supply on the 20th of May, 1967. Prior to the submission of tenders, the Department of Supply organised an inspection of the aircraft in the desert of Emu, which had been, up till now, a prohibited area. Tony Schwert was just one of the many interested people who made the long journey to Emu Plains. Uh, my first impression was it was going to be quite a mammoth job after seeing the aircraft, uh, particularly after 14 years uh, in the desert here. Although Tony was a little disappointed in their overall condition, his first impressions were soon to be altered. The further I got up the road, uh, the better impressions I've got of the aeroplanes. And, um, these two, this particular side of the mound, um, seem to be the best of all. Uh, the mound may have had something to do with um, the condition of the aircraft, I don't know. But uh, certainly they look the best of the six. And this site we're coming up on now, um, where these cement blocks are just here, uh, is where A68-1, uh, the better of the six aeroplanes, was positioned. While there were several visible scars from her experience, how many invisible ones did she carry? This was a question Tony had to answer before he went any further. The, um, uh, the radiation uh, or possible radiation hazard did concern me. Um, and uh, due to the generosity of the South Australian Police Department, I was able to borrow two Geiger counters, one a low yield, one a high yield.